We now have time for questions from you. Uh, do I see a hand? Yes. and Professor uh, Frakowiak. Uh, in, at EPFL, which is very dear to me because my children went there and I am on the board, uh, you are building uh, this project of accumulating data from various hospitals, but keeping the privacy of the data, which is great. Now, in the field of machine learning, building training sets we know that we have a problem called survival bias. In particular, in finance, in the world of hedge funds, those disappear. We don't keep any more the performance. In this particular science, are we sure that the hospitals will provide true data related to people who died? Because in this sense, it was a failure for the hospital but we need to know the truth about those who survived among the elderly people with Alzheimer and so on, and those who passed away, because we need the complete picture in the training set. You're asking two or three questions at the same time. All right. So let's, let's try and dissect them out. So, so clearly with these techniques of data mining, we're talking about big data and data mining, looking for patterns in the data as a basis for the diagnosis. That is step one. It's clearly necessary before you can go to ask the sort of epidemiological questions that you ask in the second part of your question. And the important thing is that if you're to make good conclusions on the epidemiology, you need to be sure of your diagnosis. So either you wait till death, you collect the data, it may take 10, 15, 20, well, we were wishing Shimon Perez 120 years. Uh, and, and that seems to be a slightly inefficient way of doing things. On the other hand, we have many, many years of data, legacy data, which are stuck on computers and databases in hospitals which we could make use of. So when I go to see the Swiss Minister of Health and I say to him, for my Swiss franc, you give me a scan. And I'm very grateful. But do you realize that for the same amount of money, you could get more added value? Because my scan goes into a computer and it stays there. If I come back, they might look at it again, but otherwise no one ever looks at it again. But with this project, we will be able to look at those scans again, and they will accumulate, and they will give us the big data on which to make the diagnoses. So you get added value for my one franc. You also get a research datum. And there's a very, very good economic study performed by the Wellcome Trust that shows that if you invest a pound sterling in biomedical research, you get 37% per annum in perpetuity return. So the politicians love this. We love it because it gives us good diagnosis and it helps us answer your questions. So just to maybe um, extend to what Richard said, you know, if we look at the way that we've been studying brain diseases, is that you have a lab, uh, a foundation, and what they do is they support you to study Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia or autism. And what the researcher does is he gets control subjects and then he gets this cluster this group of, of patients that they believe to be the Alzheimer's patients. And Richard has just mentioned that that is actually wrong in 30 to 40 percent of the cases, so that's already a problem. But a far bigger problem is we're studying diseases in isolation. There is just a huge amount of opportunity for, any, for you to have any knowledge on any one disease could help you understand any other disease. So what we're trying to do in the Human Brain Project is put all the diseases, about 560 clinically classified brain diseases, put them on the same table. Where do you put Alzheimer's? Where do you put autism? 
What is the relationship? Where are they, how, how do they differ? And how are they similar to each other? Without such a picture, we could never come up and say, this is unique to that disease. I, I can only say it's unique to that disease because it is something that is different from any other disease. That has never been attempted before. It can only be attempted if we can get all the data, as much data from as many hospitals for as many diseases as possible. Of course, we're going to take it in small steps. We're beginning, uh, Richard's focusing on the uh, dementias, but the goal is to expand this to all the diseases. We need to put them on the same table because they come from a brain, a human brain. I'd like to add to Henry uh, and Richard answers that one more thing that we have to remember is that in the past, brain scientists were specialized, highly specialized, not only in the disease, but in a certain part of investigating a disease or a certain part of a mechanism. For example, they knew only about the photoreceptor in the retina, and that's all they knew about, and that's what they studied. The correct approach to study diseases, just like mentioned now, and to study brain functions is to have interdisciplinary research between many different approaches and to include the psychologists, engineers, medical doctors, uh, physicists, mathematicians, neurobiologists, uh, psychologists, cognitive science people, you know, to, to have all these people not just working in collaboration, but working together. Together on the same data, on the same experiments, on the same ideas. So we were talking about looking at the data as the Human Brain Project is doing. We are talking about having experiments that are driven and lead, led by large groups of scientists that interact with each other. This is the only way in which we can make progress in understanding the brain. Each of us, each of the scientists, should be able to understand the others. And understanding the other is a major challenge for scientists also for all of us. And this is the way we hope that we will bring the revolution by this interactivity. So just to mention, yeah, that just to mention the, the, the new center in Jerusalem recruits people from different disciplines for this reason, to put them in one place to work together, not in collaboration, not just collaborations, yes? Not that I do Alzheimer and you do Parkinson. Not this, it, uh, Yadin. Yeah, uh, thank you, Elan. I, I think that you bring up uh, implicitly uh, an issue which is a very profound philosophical and technical and professional issue, which because of uh, innate, inherent shyness, uh, Henry and, uh, didn't bring up. And that's a, a sort of revolution that is in, in the HBP, in the Human Brain Project. You mentioned the fact that we have lots of data, and you mentioned also the fact that we have to understand each other, which I utterly agree. But over time, we accumulate in our field so much data that it's actually, if you think about it, I risk my disclosing my own incapabilities, it's impossible to understand your own field in total. It's impossible because there's so much data, there's so many findings, you have to connect them to each other and so on and so on. So there is a marvelous thing in, in the Human Brain Project that uh, somehow was not brought up and I hope that uh, Richard and Henry wouldn't mind, and, 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 and Idan and, and the others wouldn't mind me bringing it up. And that's the fact that for the first time in biology, in life sciences, in brain research, in a way, and please take my words with a pinch of salt. In a way, we are relegating part of the understanding of the data to a computer, because we cannot do it ourselves. So maybe we can do it ourselves for parts. I'm not claiming that we don't know what we are doing, because then we'll, they'll get, take all our grants. We know what we are doing. But there is much more to the field than a single brain can understand. And we think that in this type of project, we have to introduce a new phase, an evolution in science. 
try to think about science as a project in which, in, the, in such a problem, as a project in which you need the power of the computer, the mega computer, the multi mega computer, I don't know the terms, the blue, blue, blue brain computer, the deep blue brain computer, in order for you to understand what is it that it makes sense together. And I think that people should pay attention to it, because in a way, it's not easy for a scientist to claim that we are undergoing an evolution when you try to start it. But it's important to note. And it's another note, a very small one, I mentioned things about potential social and ethical issues. A beautiful thing in the Human Brain Project is that this attempt to understand and preempt and explain and ameliorate issues that relate to ethics and social interaction and society at all is inbuilt in the system from the outset. In the Human Brain Project, you have medicine, you have brain-inspired technology, you have brain and biology and computation and whatever, and memory and whatever, but you also have a team, international team, that from the outset starts it, it tries to understand what might be the implications concerning ethics and society. And this, I think, is something that should be copied by other projects as well. Thank you very much. So, do you want, so we'll take the next question from you, yes, please. Uh, yes, I have seen that in Japan they use... It's not on? Oh. I have seen that in Japan they use robots in hospitals uh, but what they what just said. smile at the patients and keep them company when they are lonely. But this robot speaks, and I want to know where that voice comes from. Oh, it comes from the battery. <laughs> but their thought process, their thought you can process. You, you, you can train a robot to respond to various situations. They are experts better than I am in, in this. They and actually then have feelings? They're going to miss people? Sorry? He said he's going to miss people he was friends with. I refer to this issue before, which means they, they don't smile because they are happy. They actually start stopping, stop smiling when the battery goes low. Hmm. I'm, I'm serious. But, but what makes them be able to express emotion? Oh, you, you, you program them that, that way. You, you can actually buy, you can buy, I assume, a complex Lego system and do it in your home, although I don't recommend it because it seems complex. Thank you. Uh, to, to be precise, they do not express emotions for now. You all have seen the movie Odyssea 2000. There, the robot expressed emotions. These robots do not express emotions. However, they we, we, mimic do, we, do, emotions. we do produce um, robots that express emotions, or at least you ladies do. Every little child. <laughs> I mean, you are a robot, I am a robot. We're made of matter, we respond to things in the environment because we're organic robots. We're made of Richard, speak to matter, yourself. which is organic. <laughs> the robots that he was showing was a mechanician was putting together bits of metal and bits from the iPhone. The iPhone will speak to me. So I think this is the very big difference. We talk of robots, but we talk of many things. When we talk of human beings and the animal world, we talk of the natural world made of organic matter, which is highly, highly complex. We shouldn't think of it in the same way as we think of a car or an iPhone or the sort of robot that was shown on there. That's very different, very simple, and much easier to make. So I think that distinction is a very fundamental one. And, and sometimes we use the term robot like we use the word emotion. Just because it changes its face doesn't mean it's showing an emotion. That's a simple response to a simple stimulus. When you and I smile at each other, there's a much more complex process going on. And it's that process that is important for us, for me and people who are depressed, who can't show emotion, who have mental diseases. For others, it's important just to know how that happens in terms of how people communicate with each other and understand each other and so on. So this, your question was a very, very deep one, and I think we shouldn't answer it in a superficial way. Yeah. Can you make the question from there?
perhaps a question to Professor Slutsky and also somebody else who would like to comment. Uh, and you identify patterns of diseases, perhaps patterns of depression. Uh, would it be interesting and also uh, uh, rewarding to identify patterns of happiness and felicity in respect to, in, in comparison to patterns of depression and emotional diseases? And would that be uh, an interesting approach also to the, to the project and the, and the human brain? And identifying also why do we follow these patterns and who are these persons who are really, I mean, happy, joyful? Uh, how can we identify that right. scientifically a, as is, mm -hmm. this is a physical approach? Yeah, it's a very good question because basically what of most of neuroscientists do, we are trying to understand how our experience, and it could be translated to sensory experience, to emotional experience, change the structure and the function of brain circuits. So first of all, each one of us has different experience, right? So what we call normal, it's also what we call normal. I mean healthy, right? Healthy, healthy people. And we are trying to change, for example, in experimental, in our experiments in uh, animals, first of all, right? We, we are trying to change robustly the experience, right? For example, huge uh, contribution from uh, Nobel Prize laureate uh, Hubel and Wiesel uh, we got from visual system, right? They change visual uh, experience, they made visual deprivation, and they discovered, for example, the critical period of the brain, right? That our brain is much more plastic when we are young and much less plastic when we are adult. So we take these lessons from these classical experiments, and we are trying to understand changes in patterns in connection to brain disorders as well. For example, like you told de depression, neurodegeneration, different kinds of psychiatric disorders. And we have to map the circuits. And now it's really good time to map it. So I don't know if you heard, we have optogenetic tools that we can control brain by light, and we really can see which neurons in which part of the brain are dysfunctioned. And I believe during the next 10 years, we will identify which circuits are dysfunctioned at the first stage, because we really want to identify the primary change that caused the deterioration. It will be done for depression, it will be done for other psychiatric disorders. That's what I feel. Could, could I just link this to, um, to what, what Henry was talking about earlier, and, and my reply to the robot question? Um, we're talking about deep, profound things, which Yadin pointed out may, we may not be able to conceive of ourselves. We may need the help of, of computers and look for highly complex, multi-dimensional, multi-patterns. Things we can't even describe with words properly yet. The biggest problem that we have, that the physicists don't have, is we don't have a theory of the brain. We don't know how the genes relate to the circuits, relate to the systems, relate to the co feelings, relate to the cognition. We, we, we have, we, those different levels of explanation are all separate. The Blue Brain po Project, his bit, is going to give us a theory of the brain. Perhaps in 10 years, it'll be crude. Perhaps in 50 years, it'll be precise. And then when we go to a circuit and we change it, we won't have to imagine how that little thing would change things everywhere else. You know the story about the butterfly in Thailand that creates a hurricane in, it's probably very this much the same in here. It's a complex system. But with the model, the theory in the computer, you'll be able to change things in the computer and see what the likely results are. But that's not going to change the fact as humans there is variability amongst us. That's not going to change the fact that we're individuals. That's certainly not going to change the fact that we're conscious and communicate with each other. But we may understand that much better. And from my point of view, I'll be able to test drugs in a similar way. So I won't only look at this little circuit and see that I've corrected it because it was abnormal, but I'll be able to see the impact of the whole brain. And some of those impacts will be side effects. So I'll have more precise ways of choosing my drugs. That, that's all I want to say. The next question, please, yes. So, th <clears throat> thank you, it's very, very interesting, and I understand the focus on disease. I'm also wondering whether the project 
will result in an understanding of the origin, nature, and substance of self-consciousness. So, um, I think that what we can be sure that we're going to understand is what we call the neural correlates of behavior, cognition, emotions. Uh, these are uh, uh, cognitive capabilities that are emerging, or fac faculties that are emerging, and they emerge, as Idan was pointing out, because of physical reasons. There are molecules bumping into each other, neurons uh, bumping into each other, forming patterns. These patterns have particular shapes. If uh, you get knocked on the head, you become unconscious. It doesn't mean your brain stopped working. There's a lot of activity. Your, your brain is very active when you get knocked on the head. If you go in and get anesthesia, your brain doesn't shut down, stop working. It actually can even be more active. So the issue is, what is the state? What is the neural correlate of all these different amazing things that we are capable of doing? We think that this project will give you those answers. If we can probe that further to subconscious, conscious states, it doesn't necessarily mean we've understood consciousness. It means that we'll be able to see that there's certain states that are very special and they're related to conscious-like type of behavior. So I think that's as, as far as we can be sure we could, we could get. If it is that you know, we could go much further than that, actually understand what happens in that state that produces this kind of conscious feeling, uh, this perceptual bubble. This is, a, this is virtual reality. You're all looking at virtual reality. You're not looking at reality. You're, you're, you're working inside your own bubble, but you become conscious of your own bubble. And there's something special there that happens, and I don't think that there's, we've got a science yet to describe that. But a related question related to the previous one. Al Gore visited the project, and after he listened to this, the first thing he said, he said, but what about God? <laughs> and and what, what I would like to just say, you know, I completely, as a scientist, just stay, it's not, it's not about what I believe or don't believe. The fact is, if I damage the brain, it, even if I had a soul, I won't know I have a soul. If I, I wouldn't be conscious of my soul. But, it doesn't mean that I don't have a soul. So there's no way a project like this can prove that there's no soul. Okay, if you believe that there's a soul. There isn't a method that we can prove, because if I damage it, it just means that I can't report, I can't communicate with it, in principle, from a scientific perspective. It may mean that there isn't a soul, but that's not, that's, we're not on that path of trying to prove if that is or isn't. What we can do is explore what is, what is emerging from the brain when molecules are interacting and cells are interacting and they're creating patterns. Just, just, just a bit to add, I think I, I want to be very short because questions are more important than answers and sometimes. <clears throat> I just want to say that science does not need to answer everything. There is no role for science to, uh, to answer everything. There are within science specific things we can understand, and we will understand, and we can develop robots that will feel conscious or sad, and will believe in God. This we will do. It doesn't mean that I understand what makes this particular robot to believe in God. I think we have to make a distinction. I think the humanities should deal with these other issues, and science should understand the physical basis for your feeling that you are self, that you are self-aware, your feeling that you have free will, all these things, we can say what is the, as Henry called it, the biological basis or physical basis of this. But beyond that, I don't think it's the, it's the science to deal with. There are other fields like humanities, philosophy, and so on. I think it, bring, it boils down to the issue indeed of understanding, and I wish to bring up the notion that we, in a, at a certain level, which is not mechanistic, we don't understand the simple things around us. I would challenge us to understand in the real meaning of understanding, in the deep meaning of understanding, the law of gravity. Do we understand the law of gravity? I don't think we understand the law of gravity. We can describe it. We converted it over generations into almost intuition. 
But understanding in the way you probably refer to is something that we should not aspire to achieve. We should aspire to achieve mechanistic understanding. The next question, please. Okay, please. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to see how the uh, advance of the understanding of uh, the human brain has been applied in artificial intelligence. Until now, uh, we're building neural networks that's, that are uh, helping the understanding. And uh, it's interesting to see how it's self-feeding itself. Like, the more we're going to understand the brain, the more we might use those understanding into uh, artificial intelligence that's going to help us uh, understand it even more. My question is how, uh, uh, in two, two, uh, two directions, how uh, do you work with um, other fields to, uh, to develop uh, artificial systems into the understanding of uh, the brain? And what is the state of like physical artificial system? Because uh, at the present time we have uh, virtual artificial intelligence. We can simulate on computers, but we actually uh, didn't build a physical system based maybe of silicon based on the architecture of neural networks that could help us in the future at a m much faster uh, space. So, I, I mean, we can build amazing machines today that can beat you at chess, at Go, at uh, in, so task specific artificial intelligence. It can beat humans, right? I mean, there's no question. I mean, the calculators can calculate faster than us. It doesn't mean it's intelligent. I don't believe that there's an artificial intelligence today that is any more intelligent than an ant. We haven't got it. And when Ray Kurzweil says that, you know, we're going to have computing power going faster and faster than a, than a human brain, it doesn't mean it's going to be more intelligent than a human brain. We haven't captured that artificial intelligence. We, we will be able to, in the course of understanding how the brain is doing it, be able to generate lots of very intelligent systems. I don't think it's going to be all the detail and the power of a human brain in its, in its entirety, but in specific tasks like object recognition and helping us to drive and, you know, those machines are going to be far better than us but not as a whole, as a human. So I don't really see artificial human intelligence really in its entirety being a feasibility within the next decades or longer. I'm afraid the, our official uh, time is over. So we will have to, uh, we will stay here for a while. I mean, around here, outside. I don't know if we can stay in and we can answer privately additional questions. Thank you all for participating in this. And good luck to the science and humanity.